Hi, you're on Likeable Science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. We're broadcasting here from the Think Tech Studios here in Pioneer Plaza. Likeable Science is all about the relationships of science to people's lives, making science fun, accessible, easy, helping people understand that science isn't something to be scared of. And today, to, to help me explore a, a fascinating area of this, I have two guests, uh, Mary and Douglas Keong, uh, both teachers. Uh, Mary has a master's in elementary education from Simmons College. She's a former programmer for both Hoffman Mifflin, Mifflin and from Dun & Bradstreet, I believe. Yep. Has taught for 20 years at various different levels, currently with St. Andrew's Priory, I believe. Priory, yeah. Yep. Priory, sorry. Mm -hmm. And uh, going to be teaching teaching some programming courses at Punahou next year? Or? Uh, in the summer. In the summer, okay. And then at Priory mm -hmm. during the school year. Excellent. Uh, Douglas has his master's in uh, uh, technology, innovation, and education from Harvard. He's uh, an Apple Distinguished Educator. He's uh, written uh, best-selling game strategy books and all. Uh, he's, uh, uh, his latest book is on Microsoft Education. It will soon be in the Apple Bookstore. He's an instructor uh, in uh, ed tech teacher. Uh, does uh, development of technology type thinking, has taught for 20 years, and uh, he's currently at Punahou teaching uh, computer science, iOS app technology development, right? Right, right. Ho hope I got all that. Yes, <laughs> it's kind of a, <laughs> I'm busy. <laughs> wow, that's a lot of stuff. <laughs> he is. And our topic today is basically coding. And coding is sort of covers a lot of ground here, and we're, we're going to explore some of that ground. And I thought we'd start just to get things clear for audience about what we mean by coding. It's, it's a term we hear tossed around a whole lot now. Mm -hmm. So tell okay. me a little bit about what coding really is. Okay, so what coding is, it depends on who you ask. Um, if you ask a software engineer what coding is, you might get a very different answer than if you ask a student or somebody on the street. Um, used the way it's used today um, with Hour of Code and different organizations that are promoting coding, um, it's synonymous with programming ask a software engineer, they might tell you something different, but um, since we're going with um, what most people think of as coding, it's synonymous with programming, I think we can just think of it that way. If you want me to elaborate more, I can, but. <laughs> is that, is that, does that sort of resonate with you? Well, well, it does, and, and for me, you know, I teach AP Computer Science at Punahou. And so I get a lot of the kids who, by the time they're in high school, have realized that they really enjoy working with computers and solving problems using code. And they're actually at the level where they're going to start thinking about maybe, maybe majoring in computer science or becoming software engineers. Mm -hmm. And that's when programming is actually very different. Um, I think, uh, you know, Mary's involved with, with getting uh, kids, especially girls, involved at a very early age with, uh, with even scripting and writing CSS code to create websites, uh, creating games, and uh, using coding, uh, using graphic kinds of programs like Scratch, and that's a great entry point. And where I see kids uh, ultimately in computer science is we're really looking at um, not just solving a problem using code, but what's the best way to solve the problem using code? You know, what's, what's more efficient? You might have two ways to solve the problem, but realizing that one is more efficient Element. than the other, comparing different kinds of algorithms and looking at their relative efficiency. Uh, there's some higher level mathematics involved. And so um, I think about computer science really as sort of the, the end point for a lot of people where they're really starting to appreciate the beauty of a computer language and realizing that there's an elegance to a recursive algorithm uh, that, uh, that parallels a lot of the, the beauty that you see in nature, for example. Right, so it, it's like that you want your students to become fluent in yes. exactly, language. Yes. exactly, right. yeah, almost right. almost more like a comparative language study, right. and right. you know, and it's it's hard when you hear coding used to express so many different entry points to understanding how to talk to computers and use computers to solve real problems. Right, it's to, to it's some, a huge area. Yeah, to some extent, it's in danger of the the term inquiry in science yes. got, got yes. so broadly used it yes. became almost meaningless right. and right. people right. have tended right. to stop using it right. now. Yeah, Programming uh, tends to be the elegant crafting of solutions to right. problems. So as yeah. you, I think you said the other day, creative problem solving. Yes. Right. Right. right, right. And for me the crux of it is when I work with students, even students who take computer science, 
who don't necessarily think they're going to go on and major in computer science, what I really try to get them to do is think about how do you take a large problem and break it down into steps right. and solve each of those uh, problems. Uh, I really think of coding is really the language of critical thinking. It's how you figure stuff out, uh, when you get stuck, what resources do you, do you pull into play, how do you get yourself unstuck. Uh, those are all crucial 21st century skills and I think coding and programming are a great way to model for kids problem-solving skills that will become useful to them no matter what they do in life. Exactly, and this is, I gather now, a, a, real, a real push in many school systems to begin to teach coding as sort of a fundamental 21st century skill because recognizing, just as you say, that you will almost inevitably use these same skills in, right. in your adult life. Right, you know? and I, I, um, so we also started a uh, Saturday morning coding course for girls that we teach at St. Andrews Priory on Saturdays. We just finished up our spring session. We hope to start another one in the fall and run it through the school year. Um, and I was talking to the father of one of the girls who had taken the course and he was like, oh, I really wish I could have been in on that course. He said, I'm, he's a computer engineer. He says, I'm starting to feel like I'm missing out on something, like I'm a bit of a dummy at work if I don't know anything about coding. So, you know, there he is, he's a chemical engineer and he's like, oh, I don't know anything about coding. And, <coughs> yeah. I, I, I empathize. It, yeah. it, uh, more and more you hear of these things, you see these apps appear on your phone now, right. uh, and you realize like these were probably produced by 12 year olds. And <laughs> Some of them, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And yes, what, what? It, well, it can be very empowering too, and um, part of it, it we've, we're living in a time where never before have you been able to just sit at home with your laptop in your pajamas, make something in one, one day, and the next day it's all over the world, maybe even making you some money. So there's that incentive too. There's a real entrepreneurial spirit and coding for a lot of people, coding and programming is a way to express themselves, uh, put a product that they believe in out into the world, and maybe even make some money from it. Right, so it's a very uh, interdisciplinary skill then because it involves certainly some very some tight logical thinking, some yes. scientific knowledge, almost mathematical, computational thinking certainly, and yet at the same time has these aesthetic components to it. Absolutely. So uh, yeah, so the, the programming is just one small part yeah. of it and what um, Doug does with the students he works with is not only do you need to know code and there's so much you can do with coding and programming for business and entertainment and whatever, but now there's also it, it very tightly aligned with design, um, user interface, you know, it's, it goes beyond just the if-then statements. You, you need to make something eye-catching, you need to uh, understand how people interact with devices. Right, and I think many of us of, of my generation at least, think back on our days of learning Fortran programming, which oh, was, yeah, yes, the, yeah, these if-then yeah. if -then statements, this rather tedious rather technical, rather, quite frankly, dull mm -hmm. uh, exercises in frustration when you would, you know, uh, miss input one character in the whole. Well, there, there's, there's that too. Um, it's m been made much friendlier, especially through the group at MIT who put Scratch out and right. now there's all these other uh, Scratch-like programs for even younger kids. Um, they sort of took that away so you don't have to worry about, you know, whether it's a semicolon or a period. But for some more uh, lang powerful languages, there, there is still that. But it's, again, it's attention to detail. It's debugging, it's, uh, you know, all valuable skills. You know, we talk about uh, persistent problem solving. What to do when your code just doesn't work. Well, how do you step through the process? How do you know when it's time to just get up and walk away or have somebody come over, else come over and look at your code? Um, and just working through that problem and then when you get it and you've put so much in, uh, into it, you're like, yeah. And you'll see that with the kids too. They'll be working and working and working and then their code will compile. It's just the way they want it to be. and in part because of all that hard work and because of pushing through the frustration of not getting it and not getting it, it's just absolutely joyful and empowering for them. So, excellent, really excellent. important. Yeah, that's, that's, that's one of the great things I suspect about it is it really does uh, imbue self-efficacy in, in, in yes. students. Yes. You know, they, they realize they, they have talent, they have skill, they yes. have knowledge that, that they can make, they can now sort of right. make the world work according according to their whims, as it were. Yeah. <laughs> and it's something I think that comes very natural to kids of this generation. Uh, they are different than, you know, when I was in school and I took computer science courses, I basically had a, 
a programming project and I worked on it by myself, learned how to do things you know, from the textbook and from the teacher, and then turned it in and got a grade. And, and now I think the way people learn is very, very different. Um, we have, in the real world, a lot of program, most projects are actually done collaboratively by a number of different people. And so learning how to collaborate is really an essential skill. Uh, mm -hmm. Learning pair programming where you have two people on one computer, that happens, that's more and more common. Mm -hmm. But really understanding that the communication off the keyboard can help make what you type in through the keyboard much more effective. I, th I think that's, that's an area that kids are learning a lot about now. Uh, and this ties into the, the phrase you used in an earlier discussion, we had the remix, techno uh, remix yes. philosophy, I guess, yes. Right. Yes. Uh, so, about people so, sharing their coding. Yeah. Well, we're, we're sort of in a culture of creative commons, whether it's music or art, and, and programming is definitely entered into that, where people will program something, they will put it out to the public, say, here it is, um, take it, remix it, make it better, um, do what you will with it, and then just um, just give me some credit from where you, where you got it from. And again, like I said, Scratch has a community that su fully supports that. Um, some of my students, um, we teach them how to build programs from scratch, from a blank slate, but also how to go out, like there's no point in reinventing the wheel or re reinventing the flat tire like you said before. Um, so we teach them how to go out find what they need. Is it already out there? Why, like I said, recreate the wheel? They bring it in, but then they make it their own. They make it better. And then the, the understanding is they'll put their code back out there for somebody else to then be able to remix and make better. Right. So something like Scratch, too, is, is, is a huge community. I, I don't know if our viewers realize there are, what, several million yes. different Scratch uh, all over the world. Pro programs around now. Uh, well, there's yeah, there's there's Scratch itself, which is all free, which is right. another amazing thing. Well supported, safe and secure for kids um, to be a part of that community. And then there's are, are some commercial products that are now being made that are very Scratch like huh. that are used for um, that are used uh, geared towards the younger and even younger kids. So all good stuff. <laughs> yeah. We're fortunate to be. Uh, able to, we have, there are many, many free tools out there if you have kids who are interested in learning how to code. Scratch is a great place to start. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a moderated environment, so it's a place where kids are encouraged to share the code that they're doing, it's and it's very, it's very safe, it's very visual, and so you can just learn by clicking and dragging, and very young kids can make some really great games and uh, puzzles and things. Um, there are also some great apps on the iPad. Uh, one of them is called Lightbot. Yes. And yes. Lightbot is a great way to get kids thinking about solving problems using blocks of code. Um, there are many more. Hopscotch is another one uh, on the iPad. Scratch, and I just yeah. had heard that um, Scratch is going to be coming to the iPad as well. So that's very, very exciting because we think it's a wonderful way to learn programming. Yeah, Scratch, they made this real breakthrough, the guys at MIT, in right. realizing that you didn't have to have people typing in all, right. the, all the stuff that, right. you, that by making shapes that would fit together, right. only certain shapes fit with certain other ones. You right. avoided a whole but bunch of the problems. If you, if you go and look, people have done some very sophisticated right. things with that. They've done, um, and, and schools now use it more and more. I've seen people, uh, students who have created like, uh, assignments for you know trigonometry so there's some complex coding going on they've just removed one of the barriers to get to that point yeah exactly but I mean we our language has only 26 simple little letters right and, and with those you can yes, write that's right. exactly yeah, you know, uh, yeah yep. absolutely yeah there's no limit uh, right yeah. that's very good. and as we were saying earlier I think one of the nice things about scratch is that it does foster a sense of digital citizenship and yes. how to appropriately borrow uh, from other people and then still uh, credit them uh, there's something that uh, happened with uh, with our son when he was just learning how to code, long, long and he time must ago. have been in third or fourth grade, and he was really interested in Pokemon, and so he had made a Pokemon game. But as part of the Pokemon game, he had played another person's Pokemon game that he really liked. So he took that person's code, changed a few things, changed the title, and then published it on the Scratch site and started getting hits and favorites and and likes, and um, a day or so later, he got an email from the original creator of the game, and this person had said, I don't like what you're doing. You've taken basically my code, and you've put your name on it, and I just, I don't think that's right. And it, it bothered our son enough that he brought it, to, brought it to you and showed it and said, what do I do? And so 
uh, we helped him compose a reply that, you know, he said, I'm very sorry, I didn't mean to take your, your code, <laughs> you know, I'm, not nine, I'm nine years old. And uh, he sent that off, and the reply came back, and it was from another kid who said, I didn't realize that you were just nine, I'm 13. <laughs> and it's, it's okay that you're using my code, I think it's great, just please t say where you got it and give me some credit. And uh, so he did. And then he said, and by the way, I looked at your game, and, and although it's good, here's some places where you could improve it. And he gave him some other code to improve it. So not only did he sort of acknowledge that he had borrowed it, but he also gave him some other things to use. And this started this correspondence where they helped, he basically helped mentor him. And it ended up becoming a positive experience. And, and I know that I had told him before, and I tell all my students, you know, always cite where you get things. It's just the right thing to do. But I know that for my son, that experience in the Scratch world made sure that he always cites things that he gets now. That was such an important lesson that he got through experience that um, was a really, really important one. And so I think by belonging to the Scratch community and by not only consuming content, but by creating content and sharing it yourself, mm -hmm. I think it gives you a respect for... Uh, the rights of people who create content and, and I think it just makes kids more responsible digital citizens and it's a, it's a great way to teach that lesson. Yeah, that, that seems, seems like a very powerful lesson of the creative commons as you, yes. as you called it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, where right, every, everyone's contributing, everyone's borrowing and using too right. and, and you, right. you, you do so appropriately with, with right. shared understandings. Yeah. And, and another wonderful thing that comes from that too, like I said, you could be sitting writing something and the next day the whole world gets to see it so one of my students actually wrote a program that got picked up scratch picks up a few projects that they think are unique or interesting and features them so uh, I have a student I taught them programming um, as part of their math class in sixth grade at the Priory and she then decided to use scratch for her oceanography project I also teach science and her she did it in Scratch, she published it, because you publish what you do on Scratch, and they decided to pick it up and feature it, and then from then on, for months after that, she kept getting messages from all over, from kids everywhere, um, telling her how much they liked her game. It was all about seals, so you played a game, a side-scrolling game, but they taught you about seals. And um, just how much they liked her game, they took it, they remixed it, I mean, there's no more sincere form of, of flattery than, you know, imitation. And, right. Um, and it, that was way more empowering rather than just handing in a project and me giving her feedback. She was now getting feedback from an entire, yeah. basically an entire, potentially the world on, on what she did. And that's even more empowering for these, for these kids to Absolutely. get feedback from, from other people, not just the teacher. Absolutely. No, that, that's, that's a great, great lessons for kids to learn and, yeah. and, and great to understand. Yes, the, the feedback from your teacher may be important, but the, the feedback, feedback from, from the world from, from, is even yeah, more. Right, exactly. Yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, so go, Julia. Yeah. <laughs> She's got a name. That, that's wonderful. And um, so do you think that this kind of experience then, it sounds like, I guess I know the answer here, it, it has positive long-term impacts on your students. And you, what, what sorts of skills do you think it, it really teaches them? Well, I, I, um, I was talking to, I also teach 10th grade um, math. And one of my 10th uh, grade students told me that for her, for her, programming, much like Steve Jobs said, really she appreciates it because it teaches her, she said, you know, it really teaches you how to think. And I think what she meant by that, it really teaches you how to take any problem, keep in mind the big picture, but break it down into smaller pieces, um, think your way through any problems, that there, smaller problems there might be and um, piece it all together and also you know again like we said before the patient problem solving what to do if you get frustrated because not only when we teach coding it's not just okay we're going to teach you this specific language we also try to model how do you go about learning a new language because there will always be new languages and actually Apple just announced that they're going to be promoting a new language um, so we do try to model for them how do you, so here's a new language, how do you go about, what's the first steps, what do you do when you get frustrated, what are the resources, um, and then they can use that, um, that model, that framework for anything new that they want to learn. Excellent, excellent. Well, we, have some, we have some friends who are developers who actually run their own company programming, and what's really interesting is when I talk to them, I ask them this question, how do you learn something new? Mm -hmm. And they don't go to a textbook. <laughs> 
to learn about it. And they don't go to an older, more senior programmer necessarily to get the answer. Because usually the problem they're trying to solve is a brand new problem. It's a problem for which no one has a solution yet, or it's an app that hasn't been invented yet. And so they are very resourceful about finding the information that they need. And that is the profile of the 21st century learner. If you ask most kids, most kids when they want to find something out, they find it out on their own. Um, one thing that I remember with, with my son, um, I always thought that I'd be the one to teach him how to shave because my father uh, taught me how to shave. And so for me, in my head, this was this perfect father-son bonding moment. And the day finally came where he said, Dad, I need a razor and some shaving cream. So I said, great, let me, you know, let's go to the bathroom. I'll teach you how to shave. And he said, Dad, I already know how to shave. And I said, well, how do you know how to shave? Who, who taught you how to shave? And he said, well, Dad, I went on YouTube. <laughs> and I went on YouTube myself, and I realized that there are about 800,000 other dads who are all willing to teach my son how to shave. <laughs> and, you know, it, it kind of, I, I realized that, I said, well, how did you know how to go to YouTube to ask this question? Why didn't you ask me? And how did you know to go there? And YouTube's kind of his go-to when he wanted to learn how to play guitar or when kids want to learn how to do something new in Minecraft. Uh, there is lots of sharing going on yeah. about knowledge, and there's this democratization of knowledge. And, and I realize that, for me anyway, if I, if I failed as a parent, I probably succeeded as a teacher because our kids are very resourceful yeah. learners and they find their own answers. And the kids that I teach nowadays are that way. Excellent. And that happens to mesh really well with how programming projects get done in the real world. Yeah. That's probably the biggest critical factor for success is the ability to teach yourself what you need to know. Right. Because there is no one textbook. Languages change all the time. Computer science changes all the time. The one common skill that we can give our kids is the ability to teach themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's what they learn in our classes, really, is they really learn how to be effective, resourceful learners. Right. Well, that's super. We're going to take a brief break here. You're watching Likeable Science with your host, me, Ethan Allen, my guests, Mary and Douglas Kiong from the Priory and Punahou Schools. We'll be back in a moment. Hello, I'm Martin Despang, and I'm the host together with the one and only Ali Amashta, and our show is called Urban Transcendence. And Urban Transcendence is about identifying where we have a unique situation of a vibrant city in one of the most beautiful natural environments. So how these two can coincide, sometimes conflict, how they could find reciprocity in the 21st century is what we're excited about. And we're planning on bringing in uh, a diverse body of, of guests, both from the arts and the science and the established and the wise and the emerging generation. So hope you will join us. We'll always be on on Thursdays from 1 to 2 p.m. Thank you. And you're back watching Likeable Science with me, your host, Ethan Allen. With me today in the Think Tech studios are Mary and Douglas Kiong. Mary is from St. Andrew's Priory. Doug is from, Douglas is from uh, Punahou School. We're talking about coding, and coding is a core skill, it's a fundamental part of the 21st century life for students, for learners of all ages, I guess. Mm -hmm. And so let's, let's get in a little bit deeper maybe about, about the classes you guys run and, and the, the, the kinds of uh, teaching that you do. We, we've talked before a little bit in sort of broad terms about coding and what it does and why it, it's worthwhile. But so how does, how does a class work? I mean, what, what do you, your kids all show up and then you... Well, um, sometimes we start without the laptops at all, without computers at all. We just talk about um, and do little projects that involve thinking and thinking through how would you go about solving a problem or um, pseudocode, which is very important. It's basically you're sort of writing out your thought processes before you actually go to the actual coding, whatever your language might be. So we will even start one of our fun things that we like to do is uh, we'll say, okay, I'm a robot. Here's some, a jar of peanut butter, a jar of jelly, a knife, a plate, and a, a loaf of bread. Um, program how me, the robot, is going to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. So that's something, it doesn't involve the computer at all, but it gets them thinking about steps and sequences and are there any kind of repeated steps so you could go back and do, you know, number four and five again or, um, and that's always a fun one to do. Um, we also like to, um, even though you can drive a car without knowing how it works, it's still, it, it's 
better or more interesting if you do know a little bit about it. So sometimes we will do activities that help them um, understand how a computer works. Maybe we will introduce, depending on the age level, um, binary and talk about binary, um, what that's all about. Um, so there, there, are, there are things like that just to get them thinking, get, get, get them going. Um, and there's other activities like that that we can do before they even go on the computer. And sometimes we'll take the pseudocode that they write to say have an object move around in a square and they'll be like, okay, now let's take that into this programming language and see how we would program that. Now that we've thought about it, we've sort of written it out, how would we go about actually programming that okay. in a given language? So I think we have a few photos of one of your of your Go Code class, right? Okay. Would, would, would this be an appropriate time to share sure. those? Sure. Sure. That'd be great. Absolutely. Okay. So I think, uh, well, you, you guys, you these, these are your shots. <laughs> okay. So I think this is just a shot. Uh, there's a couple things here. Just we were talking on, I think on the right side, we were talking about resources, like what to what to do. This is after the girls have been coding for a while. They um, uh, needed to share. A problem that they had and how they went about solving it and I think over on the right are just resources what could you do when you get stuck um, where could you go yeah. and here's and one then, of your students um, they're playing with a, a simple um, uh, device that you can actually do quite a lot of really cool interesting things on called the Meggy Junior and they the first thing you do just like when you when you're programming in most written languages you, your uh, first thing you usually program is something that says hello world well, in the electronic world, the first thing you do is you make a light blink. So they were programming um, these devices called the Meggy Junior, and they're actually making lights blink, and they're holding them up to their faces because they were pretending those were their eyes, and their eyes were blinking on and off. But they were that, that's thrilling. The first time you code that and you get your light blinking, it's like, oh, wow, this is awesome. What, now what else can I do? So The environment is a really relaxing environment. We keep the classes small. And we really think about them almost like creative writing workshops or like uh, you might have a pottery studio. That's how we think of code. We think of code really as a way to be creative, a way to create something either artistic or to tell a story uh, or to create a game. That's really how we think of it. And so rather than having creative writing workshops, we have creative coding workshops. And the, what you saw there was uh, this device uh, the Meggy actually has an 8x8 uh, RGB uh, screen, so it's 8x8 pixels, and the pixels can be um, any one of, I think, uh, something like 256 different colors. And so you can create some very sophisticated animations and lights, and you control it all through code, uh -huh. which is, is really a neat part of uh, programming, because what, what it does is it takes the code that you're writing and it makes it visual right. and you see it right away. Right. Right. So the girls can change one or two things and then they can immediately see uh, what happens and they can see the result of that. And that also gets across the idea of the power of variables, for example. You can change one variable and have a very immediate visual effect that's very, very different. And that's really a core, um, that's really a core concept in mathematics in general. Sure. And sure. so it's a nice way to sort of to illustrate all of that for them. Excellent, excellent. That's, uh, yeah, by, by being able to understand how a small change sort of at the start of a big system, mm -hmm. which your, your code, uh, running through the code sort of is a, law, is a law, large system, mm -hmm. can make a tremendous difference. Even a tiny tweak at the start can make a, a big downstream difference. So yeah, right. they can change one variable for color and the whole display will change or the, the speed at which the lights go on and off. Right, right. Yeah. right. Yeah. Yep. And Excellent. we've had some of the girls come back and tell us that having worked with us and having done some of these programming activities uh, helped them later when they went into school and they studied something like exponential growth. They realized, oh, that's just like the games that we were making with Mr. and Mrs. Keong back in the, in the workshops. And so understanding, um, you know, understanding and seeing it immediately is helping them later on as they go through the regular classroom. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Again, a, a good reason why coding might well be uh, thought of as a very fundamental skill, right? Because it, yeah. it, it seems to underlie other, other forms of learning and other parts of the sure, curriculum. Sure, absolutely, yeah. Excellent, excellent. And so 
what, what, do you, what do you typically do in one of these coding classes? What, what are the outcomes? I mean, do, do kids, do they all produce the same sort of product? Do they produce well, wildly that's, different that's, products? Well, that's one of the wonderful things is they will start off, maybe, you know, so for instance, when we were using the Meggie Juniors they were just showing, you start off with that blinking light. But then one of the next activities is to program just sort of a pixel art you know, make an image. And of course, they all come up with different images. Another uh, activity would be make a, um, make a screen saver of sorts. So you're going to have some kind of different display of moving and changing colored lights. And of course, they all come out differently. And then you, from there, you might move on to make a game. And some people make labyrinth games. Some people make side-scrolling games. Some people make uh, um, like asteroid-like games or puzzle games. Or some people want to pursue the art aspect of it more. So they all start at the same place and just go off into, they follow their interests. Huh. At Punahou, we, uh, in my AP Computer Science class, we actually design apps for the iPhone. And the kids then publish those apps to the App Store. So uh, we have the Punahou Carnival, which happens every year. And so we have, uh, when, for a number of years, we've had kids create a companion app for the Punahou Carnival. And so it allows you to find parking. Uh, when you can't park on campus, they, you know, I can't they, where you they put up car. a little, or yeah, you can't remember where you parked your car, and so they'll put up an alert so that you can find your car. And um, so there's, so that's really exciting because what I really like about coding is the fact that you can solve real world problems. And I think it's, it's not just solving a textbook problem, but it's solving a problem that makes a difference. So uh, when you talked about how do we start, we start coding by doing simple activities that let kids understand the fundamental concepts of programming. But we also start with a design thinking process around right. identifying what are the problems or issues or things going on in your life that could be made a bit easier. And we also try to make connections with the community to try to find ways that the things that our kids build have a purpose outside of the classroom. Um, I have another uh, student, for example, who after he graduated, um, was looking to do an app and he teamed up with another teacher who uh, has an autistic child mm -hmm. and she had designed a way to teach autistic kids to count and she's been doing this process for a while but hadn't really had a way to share that out and so she teamed up with him he created an iPad app called every value has its place and it's now available on the App Store and it's been downloaded uh, worldwide by educators and parents and trainers and people who work with autistic children. And, and it's just been really an amazing experience because she didn't know anything about creating apps and my student didn't know anything about autism. And together they had this great partnership that's, that's created this tool that, that's been really useful for people. That's, that's wonderful. Again, a, a way this, this whole Creative Commons aspect right. is beneficial to, yeah. to everyone, real, every, real everyone sharing, everyone taking. Yeah. 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 Excellent. Yeah, that's, that's super. So we haven't really touched so far on one of the early topics that we sort of mentioned w w was coding for girls. And, okay. And I know the computer science field as a field is sort of horrendously biased with, with virtually at the upper levels, virtually all male. Mm -hmm. And so you're obviously working to, to counteract this. And, right, and right. Tell us a little bit about, about sort of the, the whys and more importantly the hows. Okay. Yeah. So um, I grew up, I was always interested in math and science and puzzles and the natural world. And um, so I pursued that through college and in my first jobs. I worked at the Museum of Science in Boston and one of our programs, the camping program where you bring girls to come in over and, and sleep overnight, was one of the main focuses was to keep girls interested in math and science in the middle, eight, uh, middle school years when they usually drift off for different reasons. Um, they don't consider it uh, something that they're interested in anymore. Um, and we worked closely with the Girl Scouts then. So that sort of started my whole you know, professional career on trying to get and keep girls interested in math and science. So naturally when coding came out and I worked in the coding environment and there were some women programmers that I worked with but yes a lot of them are male. And um, so when it comes to teaching I'm, I'm, I worked in co-ed schools before um, and I've worked in just single gender and right now at St. Andrew's Priory for Girls it's all girls we're dedicated to girls education we actually just opened a new school for just boys the prep so that'll be um, just 
following all the brain research and the learning research about how girls learn differently, how boys learn differently, there is really value in having them um, in a single gender classroom. And because girls are so uh, underrepresented in the computer world, it's just uh, a nice environment for them to have just a room full of other girls and all working um, on similar projects. They can share information. A lot of it is one of them will have solved a problem and then the other person has a problem. So we also teach them to rely on each other. Um, like I might, I might not know every single answer to every programming question you have, but I'm sure somebody else in this room has already solved that. So um, it's just great to get the girls in there. I mean, I've had girls who you introduce it as a topic and they're like, oh, okay. And then you get them going and they're like, wow, this is great. This is awesome. I love this. I want to now pursue this even more. And so there's something very special about having um, uh, just the single gender and especially girls who, like I said, are very underrepresented in this field. Right, right, absolutely. When I started at Punahou, um, I started teaching the AP Computer Science course and I would go through years where we would have zero girls. Uh, there would be one girl in class sometimes and then she would drop the course because I think it's hard to be the only girl in a class full of boys. Uh, but, you know, happily recently we've started to get up near almost a third of the students in class are now girls and more and more girls are taking the course. And it's great because I've seen that the girls support each other and they help each other. And they also work with the boys. They help the boys, too. <laughs> Sometimes they can figure stuff out first. But um, I think part of our goal with the Go Code workshops is we're looking to make partnerships with other women mentors in the community who can come in and talk to girls, uh, women who have been successful with programming. And we're hoping that the girls who take these workshops form a group within themselves right. and support each other as they go on to program even outside of the workshops if they decide to do more programming. It's so easy nowadays with Facebook and social networking to kind of maintain those connections. But for us, it's also about really forming good connections with people who can support you as you go on through. So um, a big goal for us is that uh, girls will make friends and make connections that will, will help them do more programming. Right. Excellent. We're going to take another little break here. Uh, I'm your host, Ethan Allen. You're with us on Likeable Science. Douglas and Mary Keong are my guests today, and we're, we're talking about matters of coding as a fundamental uh, skill. I'm Jake Fidel. That's Sharon Moriwaki of the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. And every Wednesday, we have Hawaii, the state of clean energy. We've been doing it for some time now, and we have some fantastic guests on there, unbelievable guests who give us insight into what is going on in a very complex, sometimes very confusing, sometimes very disappointing <laughs> area of, of progress in the state. So we love doing this. We love meeting them. We love talking to them. We love having their ideas out on the table. So maybe, just maybe, we can all make some sense of what's going on. Sharon, what do you think? Thing. I think that's absolutely correct. We enjoy, we enjoy ourselves meeting with all these people <laughs> and hearing about the energy and the state of clean energy and hopefully we advance clean energy for the state. So it's terrific. Join us. Come okay, join it's us. every Wednesday. Okay, Wednesday is Energy Day. Every energy Wednesday, Wednesday. 4 to 5 p.m. Hawaii, the state of clean energy here on Think Tech Hawaii. Energy we'll Wednesday. see you there. And you're back on Likeable Science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. Broadcasting here from the Think Tech Studios. In, in the studio today with me are Douglas and Mary Keong from Punahou School and St. Andrews Priory, respectively. Uh, both coders extraordinaire, uh, but both uh, extraordinary teachers too, and, and doing uh, amazing things teaching children of all ages to, to code. Um, in our last segment, we, we were talking a little bit about, about some ways uh, that you get kids interested in coding and you referred to a, a device, the, the Meggy, that you uh, can use to help sort of make the mathematics visible, as it were, make these early coding concepts come to life right away. I think we might have a, uh, some pictures uh, of, of uh, well, what I'm seeing there is 
So that's in form seven. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's actually a, a different uh, language that we But, but we can talk girls. about that, eh? You want to talk? Yeah, sure. we can talk about it now. Tell. So there's another wonderful language out there called in form seven, and it's used to write uh, interactive fiction. What is interactive fiction? Uh, what is interactive fiction? <laughs> All right. So um, basically, it's stories that you can um, live in and interact with um, the way you might a video game, but it's a story. It's all words. There's no um, pictures or, or um, graphics or sound, although you can add them, but it's sort of a, a frowned upon because the focus really is on the story. Um, if you've ever played the old games, um, Zork, where before computers could handle a lot of um, bells and whistles, sounds and, and um, lights and graphics, uh, you just would type in what you wanted to do. So, it, it so might you can see where it's saying open door. Right. You're typing in, you can say walk north or go north. And so this is actually a game that was programmed by a high school girl about Sherlock Holmes. And so you're visiting Sherlock Holmes in his house, and you can decide to walk in, you can look at things on the desk, and everything that you inspect or examine tells you a little bit more about the story, about the backstory. And so she's really telling her story through, uh, really, uh, through narrative, essentially. Right. And if you look at the code, you'll notice that the black text is really, that's uh, the programming code that the computer understands. And you'll see that it's written very much like English. It's almost right. like you would, what you would say. And what's in blue, that's all of the narrative. And you know, that's the description, that's the graphics of this game because everything is told through words. Right. Uh, the power of this is that if you imagine, um, you know, let, let's say you wanted to talk about the front door and so you said, you know, let's imagine a weather-beaten oaken door with a heavy brass handle. If I were programming, if I were working with kids programming a game with graphics, they would then jump into Google and they type in you know, whether it be an oak door or brass handle. You could look through dozens and dozens of pages on Google before you actually found a picture of that door. And then you use that door, you've eaten up most of the class period, and then you decide, well, wait a second, for the purposes of the game, you need to have scratches near the handle as if something has been trying to claw its way in. Now imagine trying to find that picture on Google. It's impossible, you're not gonna find that. And yet, the way that I've described it, we're probably all picturing it in our head. We all see the same door. And that's when it really clicks for kids that language is really powerful and it's very descriptive. And if you want the viewer to see something, you just need to write it into being and it just happens. And that's where they see the power of language. And, and that's what I like about the text-based adventure games because you really don't have to worry about the graphics. It's really much more about the your story. skill of story and of writing. And this is also an area where the girls that we teach tend to shine. Right. Um, a lot of the boys, it's like, you know, you pick up a knife, you run down the alley, you see well, a mugger, you run the other way, <laughs> he's got a larger knife. And it's, you know, yeah, they, exactly. they're, the, the complexity of the stories, um, I had one girl write a story where you're in one room and uh, you don't know how you got there, you see a big paint painting of a woman, you don't know who she is, um, there's a locked desk drawer and you have to go into some other rooms and find the key to unlock the drawer and when you unlock the drawer, you pull it out, there are a number of old letters. And as you read the letters, you realize they're love letters to this unrequited love. Then you figure out they were written by the lady who's in the portrait. And then the more you read through it, the more you realize that you've actually lost your memory. You are the lady in the portrait, and these were your letters that you wrote and you'd forgotten. And just the complexity of that story, and it's told so simply and in just two different rooms, and the story reveals itself as you do things in the game environment, it's incredibly powerful. And so we start out by having girls play through a lot of games that have been created and it gives them more ideas for the story that they want to tell. And then they can tell the story in their own way. And the computer code is really just a way of getting to the story. It's just right. a means to an end. It's not coding for coding's sake. Huh. And I know Mary started as a programmer. I actually was an English literature major. I was a writer. I was really only ever interested in computer science and programming. Um, because it made me, it, it widened the ways that I could tell a story and be expressive. You know, writing, learning how to script and code was a way for me to create more video that could tell a video story that I wanted to tell or create a game that I wanted people to experience. And, and I find that I have that in common, I think, with a lot of our students in that, you know, for them really learning how to code is just a way to be more creative. Right. 
another way to express yourself. And uh, two other interesting things about Inform 7 is that it's free, another uh -huh. great thing, and that it is very much a sort of a blank slate. You can start at it with a blank slate and um, just go anywhere with it, and the girls do. They create all kinds of different stories. Some of them are very uh, mood, you know, you can set a mood in a story, you can have an adventure in a story, you can have puzzles in a story, and um, there is, again, code out there that if you want to know how to do something. I have a, a wiki spaces, um, Inform for Students wiki space, where people can go and get sample code, and so, again, they don't need to reinvent the wheel. If they want to know how to make a treasure chest that locks with a certain key, they can go there, they can get the basic code and then change it to make it their own. Um, and there's a whole community out there of people using Inform 7. It's a great entryway into um, coding because, again, it, as you saw on the screen in the pictures, it is written in a very natural language. It's almost like English, writing English sentences to code in right. Inform 7. Yeah, that, that's a tremendous difference from programming as I remember it, right. which, which was very much like learning a foreign language, right. uh, uh, obscure foreign language. Right, right. Uh, Absolutely, right. and the greatest thing about this is all of these languages, Scratch, uh, Arduino, which is what the Meggie's written in, uh, Inform 7, they're all free. Right. They're free and they run on anything. So whether you have a Mac computer or a Windows computer or Linux even, you can run all of these languages. And so it's very easy to entry. get into, it's an easy entry point to get into just playing around with the languages. Um, so really the reason I think to, if you were going to take one of our workshops, the reason for that would just be to be together with a lot of other people who are also experimenting with it. Mm -hmm. But if you wanted to experiment on your own, it, the, there's very, a very low yeah. barrier to entry. And, and <laughs> you can just start playing with it. And we like away. to use these languages too because they are free and they're very available. We want the girls to continue what we've they've they've started right. with us in the classroom. We, we want them to go beyond. So it, that's very important that they're readily available and um, free. Yeah, that, that that's a, a real plus. And again, it sounds like a part of that larger idea of the of this sh shared resources that are out there. Right. So that's that's wonderful that the, the people who created these languages were, were willing. Yeah, to, they're very generous. The the coding community, the programming community, is amazing. Um, it's wonderful. So you would think then, uh, I suspect you both agree that, that this learning to code is really a critical life skill for kids. Mm -hmm. and, and so how can parents go about encur encouraging their kids to sort of not not teach their kids to code? How can parents teach their kids to want to code? I guess is my question. Well. A, a lot of kids just, if you tell them, hey, you know that game that you're playing? Well, let me show you how you can make your own game. Because I'm sure if you ask them about that game and what could make it the game better, they'd have their ideas. And then if you say to them, oh, I can show you how to put those ideas into the game and make it your own, that's really all you need. <laughs> I think uh, one of the biggest keys to keeping kids engaged with programming is the idea of audience. Yes. I think if you feel like there's an audience out there who's waiting to see what you create, it's much more motivating. Um, there was a, Austin Kleon said, uh, if your work is not online, it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really make any difference what you do in your house. Unless you share it with the world, it doesn't really take on a life of its own until other people are consuming it, looking at it, commenting on it, Giving liking it, favoriting it, remixing, remixing it. it, all of that stuff. And so I think the biggest thing is to encourage kids really to share stuff. Start with Scratch. It's all a moderated environment, so it's very safe. And uh, if anybody leaves mean comments, it generally gets taken down right away. And so even for really young kids, getting them in the habit of create something, it doesn't have to be perfect. Right. You can get it out right. there and share it and get feedback and make it better. But the right. way that it gets better is by allowing lots of people to play it, beta test it, right. give you feedback, help you improve it, and then go on there and help other people improve their stuff. Because I think learning to code, really learning anything should be collaborative. It should be lots of people helping it helping each other get better. Right, and certainly it has to be shared, to, to, as you say, to become real in that right. sense. I used to teach science communication classes and point out to the kids, yes, if you sit in your garage and invent a perpetual motion machine, have, have you done anything until other people know about it? Right, right. Really not, you know? Right, right. Uh, so, yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's a key aspect there. Yeah. So you would say parents can, can help get their kids sort yeah, well, of they can, I mean, right. some people don't, don't know about it, so right. part of it is just uh, being aware that it's out there, that it's available, that it's I, free, I that it's well supported, there's a great community out there. I suspect that's very true. I suspect lots of parents aren't aware of the, the 
breadth and depth of resources right. that are there. And it'd be fun for parents, they could try it themselves. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, for coding and programming, what's really nice about it is there are many resources that are available online. Mm -hmm. So you can learn pretty much any language if you go online and there are so many courses online uh, to take. So it's easy to have a, an entry point to it. Um, but when kids get really interested in it and they decide it's much more fun to do it with other people and learn about it with other people, then uh, signing up for one of our workshops, uh, you know, our GoCode workshops would be a nice way to start. For girls. I think we've got, for girls. We've got that uh, URL, I think. Yes, uh, right. So, <laughs> uh, so if you have a girl or girls who are interested in coding and want to meet other girls who are also interested in coding, uh, if you go to that website, uh, we have a place to sign up for our fall sessions. We're going to be having sessions on interactive fiction, so creating living, uh, changing stories based on what the user does, uh, creating games using the handheld Meggy. Um, I'd like to start probably in the spring. We're looking into teaching girls how to solder and do some electronics and actually build projects right. that they can then turn around and program. So we're going to have a lot of fun this next year and hopefully build a real community of, of girls who are interested in doing more with code. Right. Well, excellent. So, sounds like very exciting and ambitious work, and I certainly wish you both the best with it. I think I think it's vital to do to get girls involved in, in coding and get all students, for that matter, right. all, all learners. Right. And yes, even some of us old folks probably should <laughs> take take a coding take a course crack, and, crack and, and learn. Yeah. So you've been watching Likeable Science. We've been talking about coding as a fundamental skill. Uh, Mary and Douglas Keong from St. Andrews Priory and Punahou School, respectively, are have been my guests today. And I'm your host, Ethan Allen, and we look forward to seeing you on future shows. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.